Happy Earth Day, and welcome back to Church in the World. This is our third week of this series, and we have just finished uh, our discussion specifically about race, ethnicity, and culture, and especially about racism, and especially the legacy of slavery. And today we're going to start a three-day series on creation care. And this is based on the ALCA social statements. Today, we're going to begin looking at caring for creation, vision, hope, and justice. Today, we're going to talk about uh, kind of the statement in general a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, the vision of creation that the church has, how the church understands the creation. And we're going to talk about the urgency of the current creation crisis. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about today. And then tomorrow, we're going to move into talking about uh, the hope that we have in the midst of the crisis and uh, a little bit about what the call to justice will look like um, in, as we follow that hope. And then uh, on Saturday, uh, that is to say the third day of this, we'll talk about the commitments of this church in light of that creation crisis. And then there will be an appendix to the week that comes out on Sunday. That's always an optional video um, because there's a lot going on on Sundays that you can watch wherever you want. And normally that's some sort of uh, reflection from the Confessions of the Lutheran Church. This week, I think I'm going to look at the first article, the Apostles' Creed in Luther's Large Catechism. So that's what's going to happen over the next four days so that you're equipped and ready for that. So this is the statement, Caring for Creation, Vision, Hope, and Justice. The prologue sets out what the statement basically does. It says, this statement offers a vision of God's intention for creation and for humanity as creation's caregivers, acknowledges humanity's separation from God and from the rest of creation as the central cause of the environmental crisis, recognizes the severity of the crisis and expresses hope and heeds the call to justice and commitment. This statement summons us in particular to a faithful return to the biblical vision. So what's the biblical vision the church has of creation? Uh, God, what's the relationship between God and the planet Earth and all of the creatures that live on this planet? We see the despoiling of the environment as nothing less than the degradation of God's gracious gift of creation. Scripture witnesses to God as creator of the Earth and all that dwells therein, Psalm 24. The creeds which guide our reading of Scripture proclaim God, the Father of Jesus Christ, as maker of heaven and Earth, Jesus Christ as the one through whom all things were made, and the Holy Spirit as the Lord, the giver of life. That's all in the Nicene Creed. God blesses the world and sees it as good, even before humankind comes on the scene. All creation, not just humankind, is viewed as very good in God's eyes. God continues to bless the world. By faith, we understand God to be deeply, mysteriously, and unceasingly involved in what happens in all creation. God showers care upon sparrows and lilies and brings rain on a land where no one lives, on the desert which is empty of human life. Central to our vision of God's profound involvement with the world is the incarnation of Jesus. In Christ, the word is made flesh with saving significance for an entire creation that longs for fulfillment, Romans 8. The word still comes to us in the waters of baptism and in, with, and under the bread and wine, fruits of the earth and the work of human hands. God consistently meets us where we live through earthy matter. So let's get something clear right out of the gate. And there's a lot of false understandings of Christian doctrines of creation that are kind of seeping from the culture into people's heads. Christians do not believe that the world doesn't matter. Christians do not believe that God only cares about saving souls. Christians do not believe that God doesn't care about how we treat animals, plants, and indeed the whole creation. And Christians do not believe that the only thing that makes creation matter is human beings. Okay? Throw all that out. None of that's biblical. That is not what the biblical narrative uh, displays. The incarnation of Jesus means that for sure, not only does God care about human beings, but about creatures, about food and farming and rain and sun and earth and water and sky. God cares about all the things God has made. When Jesus says, in John 3, 16, God so loved the world, right? Jesus doesn't say, God so loved humanity. That word, world, in Greek is cosmos. 
And it doesn't even just mean the planet. It means all reality, everything that is. God loves it. And so this notion that we can ignore creation, that we can abuse creation because we're Christians and therefore we're lords of the earth, this misunderstands how Christians understand stewardship and our place in creation. And that's actually the next part of the statement. We are intimately related to the rest of creation. We are like other creatures formed from the earth. Scripture speaks of humanity's kinship with other creatures. God faithfully cares for us, and we join with those creatures in singing the hymn of all creation. We look forward to a redemption that includes all of creation. Humans in service to God do have special roles on behalf of the whole of creation. Made in the image of God, we are called to care for the earth as God cares for the earth. We are called to care for the earth as God cares for the earth. Now, God's command to have dominion and subdue the earth is not a license to dominate and exploit. Human dominion, a special responsibility, should reflect God's way of ruling as a shepherd king who takes the form of a servant and wears a crown of thorns. So, our role in creation is to care, serve, keep, love, and live by wisdom as God's stewards of the earth. God's gift of responsibility for the earth dignifies humanity without debasing the rest of creation. We depend upon God, who places us in a web of life with one another and with all of creation. What does this mean? Fundamentally, it means that the, the notion that human beings are not part of the creation is false and is unchristian. Biblically, our role as human beings is to mirror what we have seen God do for us and for the creation and how we react to each other in creation, right? Love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself should sound familiar. That same ethic applies to creation, right? We are to see our ability and our authority in creation as for creation's welfare, not for the satisfaction of our various desires. So what's gone wrong? So this is part two, the urgency, sin and captivity. We were not content to be made in the image of God. We have rebelled and disrupted creation. As the people of ancient Israel, we experience nature as an instrument of God's judgment. A disrupted nature is a judgment on our unfaithfulness as stewards. Alienated from God and from creation and driven to make a name for ourselves, we become captives to demonic powers and unjust institutions. In our captivity, we treat the earth as a boundless warehouse and allow the powerful to exploit its bounties to their own ends. Our sin and captivity lie at the roots of the current crisis. Pause. So what this is saying is, Sin, which is a broad topic we're not going to, to exegete forever here, one of the expressions of sin is the very things I've already said are not Christian views of creation, right? The notion that creation is something to be abused, that is on its face a sinful way of thinking, right? That's how sin sees the world. I got mine, don't worry about you. I need to get what I want, and so I will take it from you if I have to. That is one of the most pure ways to identify sin is any line of thought that works that way. Any me versus the world, us versus them, right? Zero sum game thinking is by definition sinful. So what? What, what, what has this led to, right? It's led to creating structures and um, enabling forces that are hurting the world. And that's really well displayed in the current crisis. Okay, so um, there are unprecedented threats that we're living through today. Many threats are global, most stem directly from human activity. Our current practices may so alter the living world that it will be unable to sustain life in the manner we know. Twin problems, excessive consumption by industrialized nation and relentless growth of human population worldwide jeopardize efforts to achieve sustainable future. These problems spring from and intensify social injustices. Global population growth, for example, relates to lack of access by women to family planning and health care, quality education, fulfilling employment, and equal rights. Oh, look, it's that stuff we talked about in the abortion statement. Look how it's come back. It's almost like these things are intersecting. We can't care for creation while subjugating women. We can't care for creation while ignoring the poor. 
We can't care for creation while validating or at least turning a blind eye to racist forces. We can't care for creation while degrading or ignoring human life. We can't care for creation when we can't even establish justice in our own communities without vengeance and abuse and revenge and hatred. We can't care for creation while those forces reign unchecked. Okay, so social injustices actually have given rise to the climate crisis. The climate crisis has its roots in our inhumanity towards each other. Because once we gain enough power in the Industrial Revolution, those same ways of thinking spiraled into the way we treated the world. And once humanity was populous enough, large enough, and had the right amount of technology, we started treating the world the way we'd always treated each other. So, processes of environmental degradation feed on one another. Decisions affecting an immediate locale often affect the entire planet. The resulting damages to environmental systems are frightening. Depletion of non-renewable resources, especially oil. You, if you don't know, there's only so much oil on the planet, and we are burning through it. Sooner or later, it will run out. Our entire energy economy is still dependent upon oil. If we run out of it before we have alternatives, we will cease to have a power economy, and we'll go to a period of time where we had much reduced or no electricity. That could have serious consequences for global stability at this point in time. Other frightening effects. Loss of the variety of life through rapid destruction of habitats, erosion of topsoil through unsustainable agriculture and forestry practices, pollution of the air by toxic emissions, pollution of water by wastes, increasing the volume of wastes, prevalence of acid rain, even more widespread and serious, the depletion of protective ozone layers, the dangerous global warming caused by the buildup of greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide. The idea of the Earth as a boundless warehouse has proven both false and dangerous. Damage to the environment eventually will affect most people through increased conflict over scarce resources, decline in food security, and greater vulnerability to disease. Our church already ministers with and to people who know firsthand the effects of environmental de deterioration because they work for polluting industries or live near incinerators or waste dumps, who make choices between preserving the environment and damaging it further in order to live wastefully or merely to survive, and who can no longer make their living from forest Caesar soils that are either depleted or protected by law. In this ministry, we learn about the extent of the environmental crisis, its complexities, and the suffering it entails. Meeting the needs of today's generations for food, clothing, and shelter requires a sound environment. Action to counter degradation, especially within this decade, is essential to the future of our children and our children's children. Time is very short. That was in 2003. I'm sorry, 1993 that we said that. 1993. That was nearly 30 years ago. So, on this Earth Day, I'm not going to create any apologies for us. What I'm going to say is, we as human beings have the capacity to change our behaviors. We're not like animals or plants who fundamentally don't have choices about their activities. We can choose to live differently as societies and as individuals. The fact that we have not is sin. And the first step in addressing sin is naming sin and repenting of it. On this Earth Day, I invite you to spend some time in reflection about the sins that we participate in as we harm the Earth and each other. And tomorrow, we'll start talking about what the hope might be that we are called to as Christians. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that it was helpful or at least insightful. Please drop questions and comments down below, uh, or you can uh, follow us on Facebook, or you can send me an email through our website. You can join us on Sunday mornings. The link for that is in the description below. This Sunday, we'll focus a bit on creation uh, in this Easter season. 
So I hope you'll join us for that. These videos are a daily series through the season of Easter, which ends with the day of Pentecost on May 23rd. I hope you'll join me tomorrow, and until then, God bless.